words. I think that's called clutching at straws. Well, but she's sort of right, isn't she? The last general election well, did put your, you know, hopes well, of a, no, another referendum very much on the back burner, didn't it? Bit in a minute, but you know, yeah. I, I sit here as leader of a party that is right now 17 points clear of our nearest rival in Scotland, polling at a higher level than we did after our election victories in 2007 and 2011 at the same point. So we're in a very, very strong position. On the question of independence, mm. you know, when I watch, and as I think when many people watch, the utter chaos that is now engulfing the UK, when we look forward and see the implications of Brexit, you know, that sort of slow motion car crash that is developing right now, then actually the case for Scotland being in control of our own destiny, having control over the decisions that shape our lives has arguably never been greater. I, so I that's mean, the case I, I will continue to I talk to, to you make. at length about Brexit, but just on this issue of a second mm. referendum, there are some in your party who do believe that one of the reasons you did rather badly or worse than many people expected in the last general election, is that you pushed too hard oh. for an early re an early vote? Is, well, is that I mean, did, did you make did you personally make a mistake well, I, on that? I, again, I'll come on to that, but let me. I, I will I will continue to try to put some context into what you're saying. When I became SNP leader, the SNP had six MPs in the oh. House of Commons. Today we've got 35 MPs. So I think it's important to have that sense of perspective. Okay. But on my, my feeling during the general election was that whatever people thought about independence, for against it, or still you know undecided on independence. Mm. There is a sense that because of the uncertainty of Brexit, because so many things feel to be up in the air right now, that it is premature to effectively set a date right now. We need to let the dust settle. And that's effectively what I've accepted. So I've said I will so not consider... So you made a misjudgment initially then? Well, look, you can characterise it in any way you want. I've, I've tried all through. Remember, Brexit is not a circumstance I want to be in. I think the whole thing is a disaster and I think it's going to get worse. So I've tried to judge things as best I can based on the best interests of Scotland. So in that respect, I, you know, I, going back uh, without the benefit of hindsight, I would continue to, to do these things. But I've listened to that view. So I will not consider the timing. Do you have a sense of when timing. we'll know? When do you well, I, think we'll know I, the I nature of we, Brexit, as it were, well, such that you can then make a judgment about whether I it's... I think we will have to have some clarity towards the end of next year, because you know, the exit point is March 2019, and Europe says, and I think mm. Theresa May accepts this, there will be a period of ratification of whatever has been agreed. So, you know, we will... I think that's the point to take a fresh look at it and say, do we have that clarity at timing? At right. timing. So that, I'm pretty clear about that. But that doesn't mean I will not continue to make the case sure. for Scotland being independent. Because as I say, we're seeing right now, and the case for independence doesn't rest on Brexit. You don't have to be against Brexit to support Scottish independence. But what it is, is a really stark illustration of what can happen to a country when we don't take the big decisions over our future ourselves. Instead, we let them be taken elsewhere. And we've been taken down a path now that we didn't want to go down and is potentially deeply damaging to jobs and to living standards and to all sorts of other aspects of our life here. Just sort of one more point on, on that before we move on. You wrote a formal letter to Theresa May, the Prime Minister, asking for a second vote under the Scotland mm -hmm. Act. Did you ever get a formal I don't reply? Think we, I don't think she sent a formal reply, which I have to say I think reflects rather badly on her. It's, it's rather rude uh, not to reply to, to correspondence. But, you know, in a sense, I've not pressed that because that was before uh, I said what I've now said about considering again timing uh, next year. So in a sense, it's not as immediately pressing uh, now. Uh, and I'll continue to, you know, consider that in the, the timescale I've set out, but also continue to make the case for having control over our own destiny in our own hands, because that case has been made for us in many ways every single day right now. So plenty more to talk about. Uh, national self-determination has been in the news a bit, hasn't it, Allegra? Indeed. Tell us more. Indeed, a plucky separatist movement rising up against an overmighty distant government. Not Scotland right now, but as most of you will know, these are the scenes in Catalonia trying to rise, uh, pull away from Spain. Uh, riot police there, but in Scotland it was more a case of face paints and face-to-face -face diplomacy between the top players on different sides of the argument. So much more cordial. And this morning the Tory MP Michael Fabricant has tweeted, where on earth is it? It's actually at the top. It's been helpfully put at the top. Contrast the UK government allowing Scottish independence referendum with Spain's heavy hand actions in Catalonia. Robert. 
I mean, that is, there is an interesting mm -hmm. contrast. They went mm -hmm. ahead without mm -hmm. the approval of Madrid. Up to now, you've always taken the view that you would go through the formal view. process. I, I still take that so, view. So, so just to be clear, can you think of any circumstances no, where you would feel it was right to press ahead with well, a referendum without the agreement I think of to be fair to uh, the Catalan government and the people yeah. of Catalonia, yeah. they weren't really left with any choice because you had a, a government in, in the Spanish government saying there is no way that you, we, you can be allowed to uh, take this decision. It's a very different circumstance. In 2014, we had the precedent of the Edinburgh Agreement. Two governments... Uh, with diametrically opposed views on the question of independence, nevertheless agreeing the process that let the people decide. And that should always, in my view, be the precedent for referendums uh, of, of this nature. I think that's the best way to do it. I do think now, well, I'd say two things about the Catalonian situation. The scenes we saw last Sunday were grotesque and unacceptable and everybody should condemn them. I think the EU should have condemned But I was going to ask saw. you about that because, but, because, you know, obviously, what, you know, mm -hmm. you, you want a much closer relationship with the European Union than it looks yeah. as though the Westminster government may deliver for the UK. Um, some would say, I mean, the EU would rather let you down in terms well, of the way they responded to the Catalonian crisis. Well, I think they let the people of Catalonia down. Uh, you know, you don't have to agree with everything the EU does in order to still think that Scotland and the UK would be better off in the European Union. And, you know, often I think good friends, whether it's of the EU or of Spain, mm. I consider myself a, a friend of Spain, uh, have a duty to be honest when they think people act in a way that is not correct. And, uh, you know, I think the EU, like the UK government uh, and many others, should have said, look, we don't support independence for Catalonia, that's fine, but it is not acceptable to see the police treat people trying to vote in the way they did. But the other thing I would say is I think now we really need to see dialogue replacing confrontation. A way forward has to be found that respects the rule of law, that is mm. important, respects democracy, but also respects the right of the people of Catalonia to determine their own future. It can't, in a democracy, simply be illegal for people to decide what kind of future they want. That's absurd. But one of the things I think some people might say it shows is the way that national governments... I mean, there are very few countries which don't have pockets of people who argue for separation for the place they live. And you might say that what we've just seen is national governments ganging up on a people, the people of Catalonia, because they don't want to encourage separatist movements uh, in their own countries. And that yeah. must be very worrying for Scots who want I, independence. I think it should be worrying for everybody, because I think we've seen in, in recent times, whether we're talking about the election in America mm. or the Brexit vote here, what can happen when people, rightly or wrongly, get the sense that political elites are out of touch with them and gang up against them. So I actually think it's dangerous for uh, governments and, and even for the European Union to put themselves in a position where people expressing you know, legitimate desires to change the way they're governed somehow feel that big institutions are against them and, and stopping them doing so. And if we've learned anything from the experience of the last couple of years, surely it should be that. You know, at, the end of, at the end of the day, people are sovereign. And you know, whether it's in Catalonia or Scotland, it's for people to decide how they want to be governed and what their future should be. And just what we're on this issue of the potential conflict that can fare up and what we've seen in Catalonia, I just wasn't clear. Are you saying that you genuinely can't envisage circumstances where you to... would press ahead with a referendum but... you know, without the permission that I, you I, were... That's, that's not... You know, and I was uh, very closely involved in the negotiation of the Edinburgh Agreement. I think that was an important process to have in place. I would not want to, you know, I, I look at Catalonia just now and I, I hope a way forward is found that allows Catalonia to decide its mm. own future. But I, I wouldn't want to be in the position where we were in Scotland choosing to become independent in, in that kind of uh, circumstance, in that kind of environment. So we've got that precedent here and I think it was to the credit of David Cameron at the time that the UK government agreed with the Scottish government the Edinburgh agreement that precedent is there and that is the one that we should seek to have used uh, when we we look at these issues again. Now Ruth Davidson said that her priority is maintaining the union mm -hmm. um, and she, she says that's more important than the nature of Brexit that we get some would say that it's in your interest for the government in Westminster, Theresa May, to get a bad Brexit because that'll make Scots angry and that'll further your you cause know what, I, for an independent some, Scotland. Some people may be that Machiavellian about how they kind of live their lives and do politics. I'm afraid, rightly or wrongly, and maybe people think I should be more like this, I'm not. I, I don't want a bad Brexit deal because, you know, my, my constituency is just across the river here. That's it. Uh, 
uh, over uh, the effect here on this side of the river mm. uh, is my constituency. And, you know, I know that people in my constituency uh, will be uh, affected if there is a bad Brexit deal, if we leave the single market, if we leave the customs union. So people right here uh, on the south of the the River Clyde will be affected in that way, and that is the, the case right across Scotland. So Can I, just ask you I, I don't want a bad deal because it's in nobody's interest. But so equally, I don't want Scotland to feel as if it's got no options but to accept a bad deal. So I'm going to ask you about that because Cabinet Ministers are openly discussing with me the realistic chance that we leave without a trade deal at all, at all what's known as a no-deal Brexit. Um, were that to happen, what would you do then? Because that is, absolutely, well, think, that is absolutely the last thing you want, yeah, isn't it? I, well, A, I hope that doesn't happen, and it's almost... But if it if, happens, well, what let, let do? me. I, I don't think we should just accept that that kind of, uh, you know, really damaging route is inevitable, because it's the, it's the UK's approach to these negotiations that is starting to make that look mm. inevitable, so it's becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy. If the UK takes a more sensible approach, accepts that it can't have its cake and eat it in the old... Boris Johnson mm. lingo and accepts that staying in the single market, staying in the customs union is sensible and the arithmetic in the House of Commons is uh, such that we shouldn't give up on that. So I don't think we should just accept it as inevitable. But if we are in that situation, then it just underlines this belief that in Scotland we can't simply be in a position where we have to accept But what an is outcome. your contingency no, for, well, that, for that I, I, situation? I have a mandate, a hard-won mandate and an election reinforced... Uh, since then, to give people a choice over our future once we do know what the terms of Brexit, whether that's a, a deal, no deal, a terrible deal, uh, look like. So that, I think, is, is the option that has to be there for Scotland, not to have the inevitability of being taken down a damaging path by Westminster, but to have the option of choosing something different. Now, as I've said, I won't consider the timing of that until we've got that clarity, but it has to be an option for people because otherwise we're in this position of having no control over our own future, and I but, don't but, think that's what But just what per contra, want. as it were, if the Prime Minister was to negotiate something that looked a lot like full membership of the single market and of the customs union, and that appears to be what you really, really want, does that mean that an independence vote is off the agenda for the foreseeable future? I, I, I've, I've always taken the view that at the end of this process, because right now we don't know what it, things will look like at the end, people in Scotland should have a choice. But equally, as we've talked about already, I've said that we have to wait until that clarity to emerge before I make the next set of decisions around this, and that's what I'm going to do. But core to everything that I will do, what will guide me, is what's in the best interest of the people I represent as First Minister, and not simply to accept the inevitability of a path that is going to cost jobs and livelihoods and living standards and, you know, reduce our overall voice in, in the world. Uh, what, what is happening just now, all because of Tory ideology, you know, that started with David Cameron trying to appease UKIP and it's carried on down this crazy hard Brexit path, is, is not something people should simply be forced to accept. First Minister, as always, a great pleasure to see you. Hope to see you again soon. Um, so